my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Theragun. Whether you're an elite athlete or just dealing with the day-to-day discomforts of carrying kiddos around, muscle pain and muscle tension is a real thing. That's where Theragun comes in. It's a handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power. And now it's as quiet as an electric toothbrush. That's because the all new Gen 4 Theragun has a proprietary brushless motor that's so quiet you will wonder if it is on, while you soothe your aching muscles with Theragun's signature power, amplitude, and effectiveness. So I am loving the new Gen 4 Theragun. The main thing with it is the sound is so much quieter. So it's really great for bedtime because that's when I most often feel like I need it. And one thing I want to add is when I first started using Theragun, I asked them whether it was safe to use during pregnancy because so many of my listeners are pregnant, obviously. And they said, yes, you just want to stick to your arms and legs. So basically just like kind of avoid your middle section. And so I think it would be so great for anyone who's struggling with like restless legs at night or or carpal tunnel is really common during pregnancy. I know it was for me. So you could still use it a ton. And then once baby is born, you could safely use it on your neck and shoulders and all the things that get so sore when you're breastfeeding. Try Theragun for 30 days. There's no substitute for the Theragun Gen 4 with an OLED screen, personalized Theragun app, and the quiet and power that you need. Starting at only $199, go to theragun.com slash birth hour right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's theragun.com slash birth hour, theragun.com slash birth hour. Today's guest is Linnea. She's going to be sharing an unmedicated hospital birth story followed by a home birth story and then the breastfeeding complications that she struggled with. Hi, Linnea. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I've actually been a listener of your podcast since the first trimester of pregnancy with my first son, Henry. Uh, I would walk in the mornings um, at work during my breaks and listen to the podcast to kind of help me get through the morning sickness. So I've been listening for almost four years now. That's so fun. It's crazy to me that it's been around long enough for people to be on second babies. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty cool. I really appreciate what you've done here. It's it's awesome to have this place to share our stories and hear all the different experiences. It's definitely helped me through my pregnancies and births. Well, thank you. All right, let's start by hearing a little bit about you and your family, and then we'll get into your stories. So I have two sons, Henry, who just turned three, and Oliver, who just turned one, and my wonderful supportive husband, Justin. And we live in the North Bay area of California. All right. And I know you want to share both stories. So let's start with your first pregnancy. A few months after we got married, uh, we decided to start just leaving things open and see what happens. And it only took us about three months to get pregnant with Henry. I had a feeling that month it wasn't, you know, my cycles are a little shorter usually. So I was just like, oh, I think I need to take a test. And I took the test and it was positive. Um, it was actually a Sunday morning, first thing in the morning, which kind of connects to his birth story as well. And then I had some mild morning sickness, which for me, morning sickness is not in the morning. It's all day. <laughs> and um, that happened for about six weeks or so. Uh, went away in the early in the second trimester, which was good. So it wasn't too bad. Uh, I had some weird food aversions, like I couldn't eat beef for like a month, which is kind of a normal, you know, part of our diet. So that was kind of weird. And I, it was funny because I basically for a while, I didn't want to eat much meat at all. And you're trying to, you know, eat protein and be healthy. And the only thing I felt like eating was turkey, but that was right around Thanksgiving. So that worked out. Okay. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So, um, and then uh, second trimester was pretty good. I got some energy back. 
Um, we found out that he was a boy at the 20 week ultrasound, which was really exciting. They did say that they were concerned about the placenta being low lying at that ultrasound, but I ended up having another ultrasound later in the pregnancy and it had moved completely out of the way. So we weren't worried. My mom had had previa with my brother. And so we were a little bit concerned about that, but luckily that didn't turn out to be an issue for us. We decided to go with an OB and a hospital birth as it was our first birth. And that's what we felt most comfortable with. But it was interesting because I would talk to her about, you know, as we got into the third trimester, um, our birth plan and what we wanted and what we didn't want. I told her we wanted a natural birth. And she was, I would say, um, somewhat supportive of the things that we were asking for, but not completely. Um, like when I told her, you know, I wanted to go natural, she was like, oh, well, you know, you never know. You might need an epidural. <laughs> and I was like, um, okay. <laughs> but I, we, we decided to just proceed with that. Um, we also took our the birth classes that were offered by the hospital, which has allowed us to spend time there and kind of get comfortable with that space, which is good because I really hate hospitals. <laughs> so it helped us just get a little bit more comfortable with the whole situation. Did you do anything to prepare other than the hospital class or? No, for the first one, we pretty much just took, they had different classes. So they had like a breastfeeding class. They had a newborn parenting class. They had um, like a labor class, which wasn't really, you know, there were a few breathing techniques and massage techniques that they talked about, um, but certainly nothing like too in depth on that. They were just like a few hours in the evening, a couple hours in the evening, um, some of them, or I think one of them was like a Saturday for three or four hour class. So did you feel good about what you learned? Like, were you nervous going into birth or did you feel like it was going to be easy? <laughs> uh, well, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be easy. Right. <laughs> Um, I don't, I think probably most people, especially with your first birth, you just don't know what to expect. Right. So, you know, my questions, I guess, were around how my body was going to handle labor and how mentally I was going to process labor, uh, how that was going to work for me. So I was nervous. And like I said, I don't like hospitals. So that part of it made me nervous, but I just wasn't at a place where I really, was connected to like the, you know, midwives in the home birth world or ready for that kind of situation for our first birth. I wanted the, the safety of the hospital at that time. I was, you know, you don't know if you're, if you have any risk for hemorrhaging or anything else. I, like I said, everything was pretty normal in my pregnancy and low risk, but you know, you still, until you have one baby, you just don't really know how everything's going to go. So. Got it. Well, is there anything else you want to share from your pregnancy? Well, I guess the only other thing is that, um, so when we got pregnant, my father was sick with cancer and dying and luckily he was able to see the first couple ultrasounds. He was able to see like the 10 week, the, the original like six and a half week and then the 10 week ultrasound where, uh, you could see Henry like moving around and jumping around in there. And it was so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately he passed away, um, right at the end of the first trimester. So that was hard, yeah. but Henry was our, our little beacon of hope too, through that process, like being pregnant, I didn't want to be sad, but it was also, you know, this, this big light in our lives to have him coming into the world during that time. That was pretty hard for us. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear your birth story. So. I was trying to work like basically all the way up until I gave birth. I was trying to like work Well, I was going to work up until I think 37, no, 38 weeks, I think was my plan. And so I was trying to get some projects done and, you know, check all the boxes on my list, which is kind of a theme for me through this process. So it was the end of 30 six weeks, close to the end of 36 weeks. I had gone to the doctor, I think on Thursday for a regular checkup. And then, um, Friday I went to work and I felt kind of like I had a cold coming on. So I decided to go home from work early that day. And I came home and just slept like (laughs) 
Friday night into Saturday morning. And then I woke up Saturday and I felt really good. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm not getting sick. Maybe I just needed some extra rest. So we went shopping at a few different stores to get all the the baby stuff completed. You know, we had to pick up a few more things and exchange a few things to get everything ready. So we went to like, I think at least two or three stores, like walked to everywhere and then came home and washed everything and put it away. <laughs> at the time, I didn't really think about that being nesting behavior, but looking back, I was totally nesting. <laughs> So that was Saturday. And then Sunday morning, I woke up at 7.30 a.m. to go to the bathroom and sat down on the toilet and peed and then lost my mucus plug. And then immediately after, I was like, "Um, wait, there's still water coming out of me. (laughs) and I'm not peeing anymore. So my water broke, which is kind of cool because that was like, so that, you know, the start of my labor was a Sunday morning at 7.30 in the morning, which was the same time Sunday morning at about 7 or 7.30 in the morning when I took the test for Henry um, and found out that I was pregnant. So it was cool that I had that connection of Sunday morning to Sunday morning. And then I was 36 weeks and six days. So I was almost considered full term, but like technically just one day shy. So it was kind of a little bit of a surprise. I had put on my to-do list to pack our hospital bags like that day. (laughs) So when I was sitting there, I was like, oh, okay, well, my water just broke. Um, I guess we need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, Because that had been the agreement with the doctor was, you know, if you're wait to labor it, my plan was to labor at home as long as possible. But if your water breaks, you have to go into the hospital right away because there's the increased possibility for infection and they want to keep a closer eye on you. So We took our time. I knew that at the hospital, they don't let you eat most of the time. You know, you're subject to all of their rules and regulations. So I had a good breakfast and packed up our, uh, we packed up our hospital bags. And it was funny because my husband was like, oh my gosh, like he was a little bit panicked. And I'm like, it's okay. We can take a couple hours. We don't need to be in a rush. I'm not having contractions right now, but we do need to like mosey our way on over there. So Uh, We arrived at the hospital uh, just before about 10 a.m. And it was funny because I was standing there talking. And while we were driving to the hospital, like my I had put a pad on to absorb the water, but my uh, pants were like completely soaked by the time we got there and we're checking in. So I was talking to the lady at the check in desk and, you know, we had something in common. So we were were chatting about that. And she was like, are you having contractions? And I was like, "Mm, well, that's a possibility. Like maybe (laughs) I think I feel something that could be a contraction, but it was so mild that it wasn't interfering with anything that I was doing at that point. It was like, well, you know, like, why are you here? And I'm like, well, my, I'm pretty sure my water's broken. (laughs) I like looked at my pants and she was like, oh yeah, I think so. (laughs) So then we got checked in and the Nurse did an initial check, and I was about three centimeters dilated and 80% effaced. My body was definitely starting to prime and be ready to give birth. But they figured since I really wasn't having, I was having extremely mild contractions or wasn't even sure if I was having contractions, they figured it would probably be kind of a while. And they were like, well, you have 24 hours, and we need to start you on antibiotics soon, and we need to, you know, all their checklist of things that need to happen. Based on the education that I had had, I did watch the business of being born um, before that birth as part of, I guess, you know, additional education. I knew that if we asked them to wait, like I had wanted to do, you know, delayed cord clamping, all natural, all those things. So I was like, well, I had heard that the, the key language is not to say no in the hospital as much as to say, can we wait on that? And that can sometimes give you enough time to do things the way that you want to without going through the procedures that they put in place as much. So initially they got me checked in and they wanted to put me on Pitocin and I used the magic words and said, um, can we wait for just a few hours and see what happens? Um, so they said that was okay. They did put the HEP lock in, which I was okay with because I knew that was part of the requirements, but they actually didn't hook me up to anything. So it was just in my wrist or in my hand so we got settled and they had told me we, I might have to be moved to one of the other non-delivery rooms 
if someone else came in and needed it more urgently than I did, because I thought it was going to be at least a day for me. But they never ended up moving me. So I guess they didn't have that situation come up, which was nice that I didn't have to worry about that. Um, I also made my husband go get food because I knew things could be a while. And, you know, it was about lunchtime at that point. And I was like, yeah, before things get too intense, like you really need to go get something to eat so that you can be fueled and ready to, you know, do this. So at about one o'clock, uh, the contractions started to get a little bit stronger. I could start to feel them more. Oh, and then the doctor too. The doctor was the on-call doctor because it was Sunday and my particular doctor didn't happen to be on call that weekend. And she was in surgery for several hours. So I actually didn't see her until about 3.30. And by the time she came to check in, uh, the contractions had gotten strong enough that I couldn't really talk through them anymore. And so she came over and she started like trying to talk to me about my birth plan and, and, you know, well, we need to talk about this and what about this and you need to make this decision. And I was like in the middle of the contraction and I'm like, I can't, <laughs> I'm just like, I can't talk to you right now. And she was like, oh, don't tense up, honey. It'll just make it worse. And it was so patronizing, which was kind of frustrating, but I had never met her. I didn't know her at all. So it was, it was kind of a an interesting situation, but that's, you know, the way that some practices work with the rotating schedule. They just, well, I saw the same OB for all of my visits. And then, you know, whoever was on call was whoever would deliver your baby for your birth. So, um, so I, after that, um, she said she would come back at about seven o'clock to check in on me and see how things were going. After she left, I, moved off the bed and onto the toilet and they allowed me to be off the monitors for like 40 minutes out of an hour or so. That was their rule. So I just went in there and sat on the toilet for a while and just thought about opening my cervix and moaned. I actually had heard something on your podcast about like a mom moaning the word open. And so I did that for a while and and things were going pretty well and they were continuing to get closer together and more intense. And then uh, about 4.30, the nurse came in and told me that we had to get back on the monitors again because it had been about 40 minutes. I also brought in a yoga ball, which was like another option where I could be on the monitors but not laying on the bed because that was pretty terrible. And I was starting to feel a little bit pushy and the contractions were like really intense. Like my husband was... Um, amazing support through this whole process. He left me alone when I wanted to be left alone, but also like when I was sitting there on the yoga ball and I hadn't wanted to move out of the bathroom, but she kind of, you know, told me that I needed to. So he was sitting there giving me sips of water and just like rubbing my shoulders and giving me support the whole time. He's an amazing support person. And it was kind of cool that they mostly left us alone and let us kind of do, you know, work the process together and be there together with our labor and not have um, a bunch of other people interfering all the time once I kind of told them what my plan was. So at that point, though, when I started to feel the contractions get more push, pushy, <laughs> I was like, hmm, okay, well, they weren't going to come check me till seven, but I, I feel like I need another check. <laughs> so at, oh, at about five, I asked the nurse to come check me. And she was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I really need you to tell me where I am because it's getting like really intense and I don't, I need to kind of figure out how I'm doing here. So she checked me and I was seven centimeters. So I had made a lot of progress. Yeah. Were you feeling super encouraged? Yes, I was. I was super excited about it. I was like, oh, great. Well, all this pain was progress. So, you know, <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> And then I stayed on the yoga ball and, well, I guess I got off the, she had checked me on the bed. I got back onto the yoga ball and labored through a few more very intense contractions, which now looking back, I was like, that was totally transition. Um, <laughs> and at about 5.15, I was like, I am like really like pushing. Like, I feel like I, my body is pushing. I'm not trying to do anything, but I can't help it. <laughs> so 
you know, I, I was like, uh, I really, I feel like I'm pushing and my noises have changed. And so she came in like looking at me and she was like, Oh wait, no, it's been like 15 minutes. She's like, no, no, don't push. You'll destroy your cervix. Like you're not fully dilated yet. And I was like, well then check me again because this baby is being pushed out involuntarily. Like I can't control this. Um, so she checked me and that was the most painful thing. Like when she checked me at that point, she just kind of like shoved her hand in there and I don't know what she did, but she checked. I think it was like during the middle of contraction too. And she just, it was very, very uncomfortable, but I was fully dilated and complete, which of course, then she told me to, to not push because the doctor wasn't there yet. <laughs> And I'm like, well, this baby's coming out. Like, I'm not going to roll over and close my legs. Just get the doctor here or somebody stand down there and catch. It's crazy how often I hear that. It's like they don't realize that you can't control that urge. Well, and you would think, yeah, you would think working in a labor and delivery and seeing it every day, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, that's an involuntary part of your, your body. Your body knows what to do if you trust it. Anyway, so the, the doctor showed up at about 5.30. So she didn't take too long to get there. Um, and then I started officially pushing at 5.40. And I had asked for the possibility of being in other positions for giving birth. Um, and my doctor was kind of unsure about that, I guess when I had asked originally. Um, but when it came down to the actual moment, I was so in labor land that, you know, was like, Oh, on your back with your legs up. Like that's, you know, how we're going to do this. So I basically accepted that. And just, I was in the middle of trying to push a baby out. So I didn't really think about positioning or, you know, changing that at all. He was, sunny side up he was facing in the wrong direction so I think that's part of why my some of my contractions and my transition were so intense uh, he was a pretty small baby so he came out pretty easily um I only pushed for about 10 minutes and he was born at 5 49 p.m and he was six pounds and six ounces and about 18 inches long and he was the sweetest thing ever I remember um, when he came out and they put him right on my chest, I, the only thing I could say was, Oh my God, <laughs> Oh my God, you're here. Um, and it was so beautiful. There's nothing like meeting your first baby for the very first time. There's, that's a, a moment in your life that stands out from all the rest and will be ingrained in my memory forever. Amazing. Well, how was your postpartum after that birth? The postpartum challenge I had with that, which was, I guess, pretty common and somewhat minor, was um, I did have a second degree tear. Mm -hmm. Um, So she had to do a few stitches. And it took me about like six months to really heal from that, which I didn't expect in the long run, it wasn't too bad. It's just that it gave me that incentive for the second birth to be like, I really don't want to tear again because that was frustrating. Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was not fun. Um, and then Henry, because he was small and a little bit early, um, he lost like, you know, on the higher side of the allowable weight gain initially, and it took him kind of a while to gain his weight back. We had to go in for bilirubin checks all the time in the first few weeks because he was pretty jaundiced. We didn't end up going, like, taking him to put him in under the lights or anything, but we did have some challenges there. But um, so his first few months of life were, you know, trying to figure all that out. And when you're new parents and you're, it's all new to you anyway, you know, that can be kind of challenging, but, um, eventually we found the right pediatrician and figured it all out. And he is a healthy, happy three-year-old now. So, uh, it's amazing how much he's grown in three years. <laughs> <laughs> and once you have a second, the older one seems huge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're like, I didn't know it. when we had the, uh, the second, when we had Oliver, it was like, Wait, how did Henry get so big overnight? 
<laughs> because then you have a newborn baby again and you're like, what? He's so tiny. Yep. So how far apart are your two kids? And let's get into your second pregnancy. So they are two years and 11 days apart. <laughs> Okay. Which was not exactly our plan. We were thinking more like three years, mm-hmm. but Oliver was our sweet surprise. So we also discovered that apparently October is our month to get pregnant. <laughs> because <we have laughs> two June babies. Um, and so, yeah, so we found out in early no- November, I actually had a little bit of implantation bleeding with Oliver, which is when I suspected that we were pregnant again. I had stopped breastfeeding Henry at about 11 months, kind of naturally. He was ready to go. He was on the go all the time. And um, I pumped for another couple months with him just to make sure he got milk through his birthday and a little bit beyond. And then we were moving. So I gave up on pumping at that point. I was like, oh, he doesn't care anymore. And he's he was fully transitioned to food and uh, cow's milk and all of that. So like I said, we moved in July and then we actually moved from the Central Valley. We live in the Bay Area now. Um, but during that time, we had moved from Stockton to the North Bay Area. So things were kind of crazy in our life. We were trying to get our new house settled. And I, like I said, had had some unusual little small amount of bleeding in the middle of my cycle. And I was like, Oh, that's weird. And then kind of looked it up and I was like, Oh, um, I think I know what that is. (laughs) So, uh, we waited till early November and took a test and it was the first time, you know, like took the test and like let waited for the allotted amount of time. And the second time was like, I peed on the stick and looked at it and it was already like, (laughs) showing up. And I was like, okay, so we're (laughs) going to have another baby here. (laughs) So like I said, we were a little surprised initially, but, um, now looking back, I really can't see it any other way. It's challenging to have two kids two years apart. Uh, there are a lot of logistics and they're both still, you know, need a lot of things at the same time, but it's also amazing to watch them and their relationship. So I'm really excited about that. Um, it's also a fun, fun age gap to have as far as that goes. So with my second pregnancy, the morning sickness was a lot worse than the first pregnancy, which is nothing as far as, you know, some people that have really severe morning sickness, it wasn't anything like that. But I only threw up like once in my first pregnancy and I threw up like daily in my second pregnancy during that same like four to six weeks that I had morning sickness. The other hard part was I really didn't eat want to eat much at that time, but then not eating made me feel worse, made me actually throw up. So it was like this really hard, like catch 22 of trying to figure out what to eat that could hold me off and help me not throw up. Did you find any things that worked well for you? Um, like really bland stuff like oatmeal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or crackers kind of sometimes I would able, was able to like get something down or, you know, I would just get, cause you're busy with a toddler too. And so I would be busy like trying to take care of Henry and do the things that he needed. And then all of a sudden I would feel super sick. So I would go throw up and then I would immediately go make myself food. <laughs> cause if I did that, that it could, I could, um, get it to like go away for a little while, but It was miserable, but like I said, luckily for me, the morning sickness hasn't lasted more than, you know, a month to a month and a half. So um, at least it's somewhat limited in time frame. Uh, It was funny, too, because I also had a weird food aversion to Mexican food with Oliver, which was like my favorite thing to eat with Henry and one of the only things I could eat for a while with him. So... (laughs) It's kind of funny how that switched with the two different pregnancies. And then I was, because I was so sick and compared to what it was with Henry and things seemed so different, I was like, okay, this is either a girl or it's twins (laughs) because (laughs) everything was so different. And I was like, well, I better make sure that it's, I, I, we don't have like a lot of twins in the family or anything, but I just thought I was like, oh, well, oh my gosh, I hope it's not. 
that would be crazy. That would be really uh, intense. Although I, I've talked to lots of twin moms and they enjoyed their, you know, pregnancy and babies and it was a whole different adventure, but I was, so I wanted to go make sure, um, like that everything was good, that the baby was healthy and hopefully that it was just one baby in there. Um, so I, because I was planning on wanting to have a home birth, but if I had a home birth and you can't do twins at home, um, that's just so the, basically the way the licensing works in the state of California, they have restrictions on what home birth midwives are allowed, you know, what their scope of practice can cover and twins, um, have to be delivered at the hospital. So in order to hopefully have the birth experience that I was aiming for the second time around, um, I was hoping that it would just be one sweet baby instead of two. So I made an appointment with the, um, OB office and went to see the nurse practitioner at around 13 weeks and ultrasound showed a normal, healthy baby, uh, which was great. It was so fun to see him moving around in there. And of course, then she wanted to consider me high risk because Henry was born at 36, six. So technically preterm. She said that their procedure was to start cervical checks and I think it was progesterone injections at 20 weeks to make sure I didn't go into labor early. And I was like, that sounds like a lot of interventions. <laughs> so, you know, I told her that I was considering midwives and, you know, a different path. And, you know, I was like, well, I just needed to kind of check in and, you know, if I need you, I'll call you. <laughs> So, um, from there we proceeded to interview a couple of different midwives and, um, we found this really great midwife practice, um, in Davis, which is about 30 minutes away from us. And they are birth stream midwifery and they have usually like three full-time midwives, um, on, in their group as well as like right now they have a couple students. So, and they usually have their standard is to have two midwives at your birth if possible. Um, or, you know, if they're both not there for the actual birth, then they have the second midwife comes as soon as she can so that they have two, you know, one for the mom, one for the baby. They've been in practice for quite a while, at least. Well, so the, the midwife who owns the practice has been in, in practice since, before the licensing was even available, I believe. Um, she's amazing. So they also have like many, many years of experience with the practice. Um, and I just, we, we decided that we vibed with them really well and they just seemed like the right choice for us. We started seeing them officially at around 15 weeks in late January and second trimester went well. Uh, one of the cool things that they helped us to do was I really didn't want to do the glucose test, the standard glucose test, just because that's, I don't know, it seems like it's just like a crazy sugar rush and then you can, you know, fail it. And then there's really no, like, then you have to go take the second test and it's a lot of stress. I didn't really want to expose myself to that stress if I didn't need to. So we actually did the alternative, which was like blood sugar monitoring and a food log for about a week. Um, so that was really cool because it gave me the information about what my blood sugars were after eating during certain times of the day and everything was great. So we didn't have to worry about, uh, gestational diabetes, which was good. And then we decided to have a 20 week anatomy scan, uh, ultrasound to check in on the baby and also to find out if we could see his gender. And we found out that we were having another boy, which was exciting. We, we were you know, obviously excited either way, but it was kind of this crazy, like, oh, we're going to have two boys two years apart. This is going to be really crazy, but fun. And it was cool. The midwifery care was so different than the OB care that I had. You know, OB visits were like 10 minutes and they were, you know, check on the baby. How are you doing? Okay, bye. And the midwife visits were, you know, really like feel and listen to the baby and, ask me how I was doing and how was my nutrition and my sleep and, um, really caring and 
more comprehensive than the OB care. And also like the standard OB model, you really have to kind of fight for everything that you want. Whereas the midwives are really there as your partner in healthcare and they really support you a lot more in your desires um, and trying to help you have the, the best birth possible, both, you know, obviously safety is the first priority, but then also having, you know, the birth that you want and that you feel good about um, no matter what happens. So that was really amazing. They also had these great recommendations. I had some, a little bit of anxiety and which is kind of normal for me, I guess, later on in the pregnancy. And um, so they recommended uh, magnesium, which helped me de-stress and sleep better. And then I also took some papaya enzyme tablets for heartburn, which are amazing because then you're not worried about the quantity of Tums that you're <laughs> eating constantly. I didn't really want to do that because I had heard too many of those could cause, could, you know, not be good for the baby. So the papaya enzymes were completely safe, but also worked amazingly. I still use them if I have any. Surprisingly delicious too. They're like little sweet tarts. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They're not terrible tasting either, which is really nice. (laughs) And then the other cool thing was, so in the early in my pregnancy, I had seen an email for you from you, or maybe I had heard something on your podcast about the, you were starting the know your options childbirth course. And I was like, oh, this would be a really cool opportunity. So, and the other thing about that is it's all online. And so I was like, yeah, we're not going to be able to like go to some class. Like, you know, we could have signed up for some separate thing, but with a toddler, the only time you really have is like nighttime where my husband and I would both be available to do something. You can't go somewhere when your toddler's asleep upstairs. Yeah. So it was fantastic to have that course available. Um, plus the Facebook group is really cool because, you know, all the moms are, are sharing what's going on. And I really liked how the course was also broken down into really like bite-sized modules. So we could decide to focus on, you know, each piece of it. And it's like, okay, well, we're going to watch this piece tonight and that piece tomorrow night and this piece next week. So, it also made it easy for us to break down in really manageable chunks when you're busier and you have, you know, one or more children already and you don't have as much time to go to a three or four hour class. Yeah, I feel like I've heard from a lot of our students that it just is so much easier to like pay attention to. You don't just zone out if it's, you know, a four hour video or something that <laughs> it get everything starts to kind of sound the same. Plus, if there's something you missed then you can go back and watch it again. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's easier to find (laughs) rather than trying to. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, well, what was that thing that we heard about? Or what was that link? Um, So that was super helpful. (laughs) So thank you for offering that class. Yeah. And you were in our first group of students, right? Uh, Yeah, I think so. Awesome. Oh, and the other thing was the midwives also offered a catch class, which was basically just if the midwives don't make it on time, here's what happens during birth. And if the midwives don't make it on time, dad, here's what you need to do. Or also, um, dad, here's what you need to do to prep for the birth before the midwives get there. And so they gave them a checklist, which is really helpful for dads when mom is in labor to have, to give them some things to do. Also like when to call the midwife, which was an important factor. So uh, and then I had some Brax and Hicks contractions around 36 weeks. Um, we had a like baby welcoming party and I had run up and the down the stairs a bunch of times that day. <laughs> and that night I had some contractions. I like woke up in the middle of the night and had to come down and like drink a full glass of water and like calm down. I was like, you are not going to labor at 36 weeks. This is not happening. You're going to wait at least one more week. <laughs> so, cause the other thing is that, um, midwives cannot deliver at home before 37 weeks um, in California. And I think it probably in most states. So we, we had this goal of making it to at least 37 weeks um, Mm -hmm. farther if possible so that we could uh, make sure that we could deliver at home. 
So I also lost a little bit of mucus plug, started losing a little bit between 36 and 37 weeks, but nothing else happened. Um, so then I had my 37 week midwife visit and I was so excited because then I was like, yeah, we made it. So for our birth, I started losing mucus plug, uh, more mucus plug around Friday, Friday night at seven and then had irregular contractions, um, starting about seven 30. They're about 10 to 12 minutes apart. Um, I called my midwife who was on call, uh, my mom and my best friend, who was going to come pick up Henry and take him to her house while we were giving birth. Um, cause I, he was too little to be here for the birth. I was concerned that, you know, when I was in the middle of everything that it might be too intense for him at that age. So I just called everybody to let them know what was going on and, and that, you know, things might happen sometime in the next couple days. So I also, as with my first birth worked on my to-do list, (laughs) I needed to get everything done Uh, I missed the opportunity to do my belly cast, so I did that at about 10 o'clock at night (laughs) Um, because I had one. I had bought the kit to do it with Henry and missed the opportunity. And then I also like finished the thank yous from the party and just had to finish checking off all those boxes on my list, which is very much a me thing. Um, And then I had the contractions were there, but very light. from about 12 a.m. to 2, I was pretty excited. So I was needing to go to bed soon, but um, it's hard to go to bed when you're in labor and you, you're excited to meet your baby. Um, they got to about eight minutes apart. And then about between two and four, they started getting a little longer, like more like 45 seconds long. And they moved to like four to six minutes apart. And at that point, I was trying to sleep, but I would sleep for like fall asleep for a little bit. And then the contractions would wake me back up. So I really didn't get a whole lot of sleep that night. And then about five o'clock in the morning, I started hearing the birds chirping and the, you know, light between five and six light started coming back into the sky. And I thought about Henry waking up and the contractions kept their intensity, but they started to space out a little bit more. Um, which I had heard there's this thing called the toddler effect where you're, if you know that your other child or children is not supposed to be around for the birth or your body isn't really wanting that to be, to happen, then your labor will kind of space out for a little bit so that you can have the time to let your other children go where they need to go before you give birth. So I let everybody sleep overnight and called, um, Leslie, my midwife, um, my mom and Sarah at about seven o'clock in the morning and said, Hey, um, I think things are going to happen. Things have continued to progress. So, you know, Sarah, can you please come over here, (laughs) you know, eat some breakfast and then come over and get Henry. Um, and then he came downstairs at about eight 30 in the morning and the contractions went to like 10 or 15 minutes apart, which was crazy. They like, all of a sudden it was like, I'd have one and then like 20 minutes later, I'd have another one. And I got to have that special snuggle time with my first child before I became officially a mom of two. So that was really special. I really uh, appreciated that moment. And then uh, Sarah arrived at about 9.15 and we got everything ready. And they were getting ready to get out the door and I had three contractions five minutes apart and I could no longer talk through them (laughs) I had to like stand holding onto the wall and start breathing and I was like oh okay (laughs) things are picking back up again so um, I called Leslie right after they left about 10 a.m and she thought I sounded fine on the phone but I was like no I really think you need to come now because they are also you know 30 to 45 minutes away and you know Davis and Sacramento And I said, and they, you know, it takes a few minutes for them to get everything in their car and go. So I was like, I, yeah, I really think I need you to like, you know, get stuff ready and come here now. (laughs) And Justin um, had been like, well, are you sure it's time to call the midwife? You seem like you're okay. And I was like, no, I really think I need, I need her to come now. 
So she came over, told me she would head over. And as soon as I got off the phone, I headed upstairs and went to sit on the toilet, which is now, after having a second birth, my go-to labor position. (laughs) Uh, It just seems to really help me uh, dilate and is the most comfortable place for me to be for most of my labor. So, or at least the active labor portion. So... Um, I sat up there and I breathed and moaned through my contractions and Justin was getting the tub set up and other, uh, preparations done. I also listened to my playlist. So I was kind of like rocking out a little bit and (laughs) somewhat enjoying the process, but the contractions were also pretty intense. So I was just in the zone. Um, and they were about four minutes apart at that point. Um, She arrived, so Leslie, my midwife, arrived at about 11 a.m., and then the contractions were more like two or three minutes apart. She quickly helped Justin finish filling the tub and getting everything ready, and then they, I was like, is the tub ready? I need to get in the tub. Um, So they were like, all right, all right, it's it's ready now. You can go get in there. So we got into the tub at around 11.15, and it was funny because they were both asking me, like, oh, is the temperature okay? Is everything okay? And I just... I was like, no, I can't talk right now. Like I just sunk into that water and it felt so amazing. I a hundred percent, well, I don't, I've never had an epidural, so I don't know what an epidural feels like, but I would definitely agree with the sentiment that the tub is the midwives epidural because it is amazing as far as, um, changing the dynamic and pain relief and, um, or at least relief of the intensity um, that I was in the middle of at that point. So, and then I had a couple of intense contractions and my water broke, which at first I didn't really know what happened because I felt this big pop. And then he, it felt like his head just dropped down all of a sudden. And I didn't know what happened (laughs) initially. Um, but my midwife checked the water and she was like, yep, that's your water. So, um, and then I started pushing with the next contractions and I actually crowned for at least a couple contractions, about a couple minutes. And, um, I reached down and felt his head as he was coming out. And I actually had asked, uh, Justin and Leslie to make sure they got a video. So I was like, oh, grab the camera. Like, I want to, I want this on video because I want to be able to remember it and see it. Um, so it was so cool. Like as he was, as I felt his head kind of coming out, I was like, oh, hi, hi. <laughs> so I was welcoming him. Um, and Justin was funny because he was like, oh, he has so much hair. Because when Henry was bald or born, the the doctor had said, oh, this little one doesn't have any much hair. (laughs) So uh, it's kind of funny that apparently when both of them came out, somebody was commenting on how much hair they had. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And then I pushed for about five minutes and he was born at 11.28 a.m. And he was seven pounds, three ounces. And almost uh, 19.75 inches long. So he was a little bit bigger, a little bit longer than Henry. And then I delivered the placenta in about six minutes. So I was pretty fast and snuggled with him. And then we got to crawl into our own bed, which is the very best. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say what the best thing is about home birth, but (laughs) that has to be near the top of the list. Like being able to crawl into your own warm, comfortable bed after giving birth is the most amazing feeling. Um, and then we, we had like, nobody was in a hurry to cut the cord, which was really nice. We had, um, definitely delayed cord clamping and the midwives brought in this cute little birthday cake that they make, which is like healthy snacks and on a plate arranged in like a really pretty format with a candle in the middle. And they sang happy birthday to Oliver. And it was interesting because I delivered him at 37, five. So almost a week later than Henry. Um, but his gestational age estimation based on the different signs that they see on, like they do a, an estimation with, um, like all these different metrics once when they do the newborn exam and he was 
showing basically 40 weeks as far as his development goes. So um, apparently with both these babies, I've just had them a little earlier than I'm on the lower side of that, that average rather than the higher side. Um, but they were both fully developed and Oliver was definitely benefited from that extra week. It was good. Um, and we enjoyed the breast crawl and wonderful skin to skin time. And he actually latched a couple times before the midwives left. So, uh, they checked him initially for like an obvious tongue tie and didn't see anything. So as far as the first day or two went, we thought everything was pretty good and normal. And we had an amazing home birth. How was your recovery this time compared to your first? So I had no tearing, which was awesome. (laughs) I think the water and the position that I was in and just kind of allowing my body to do what it needed to do and crowning, you know, the length of time that it, you know, that my body needed to, to, for him to come out and also him probably being the second baby instead of the first helped, I think, with all of that. So it was really nice. That part of my recovery was great. Um, but unfortunately, um, we started having challenges with his latch in the first couple of days. I used, um, we went back and looked at the, or watched the videos and the, the part of the course, the know your options childbirth course for breastfeeding. And we use some of those techniques cause it's amazing how much you think you remember, but you actually forget like the little details between, baby number one and baby number two, even if they're a couple, only a couple years apart. Um, there's a lot of little tricks and tips and things with latching, especially a newborn that it's good to review and remember. But unfortunately that, uh, didn't really help us because, um, by day three, my nipples were sore and bleeding. Breastfeeding was causing like labor breathing level pain is kind of what I call it. Like I had to like take really deep breaths and sometimes vocalize a little bit, which is not normal for breastfeeding. Um, so I, and I, you know, we were trying all the things, my midwives were here. Uh, I started pumping as needed to make sure I was keeping up a supply and relieve engorgement and also give my nipples a break from him. Um, he was breastfeeding like every two or three hours for 45 to 60 minutes, which is kind of a long time. Um, And I had started giving him pump milk by about day five because I wanted to make sure that he didn't have like the long jaundice or weight issues or anything else. Um, So I, you know, made his intake of milk a priority and the breastfeeding kind of second to that. Um, And I had also started to get a clogged duct and mastitis, um, which was starting to become pretty painful. Um, but the midwives were able to give me some herbal remedies that helped, um, one of them is called happy ducks and it helps you. It's basically just causes you to leak, but it also has some immune support in there to try to help get the clog out. And then also she gave me an antibiotic cream for my nipples to help them heal without getting to reduce the infection and, and not hopefully not get any more infection. So Um, I got that one taken care of and we were still trying to nurse like first, but then I would nurse and pump and feed him a bottle and that starts to become really overwhelming really fast. But, you know, I was really determined to try to do the best that we could and, and keep breastfeeding, um, He would latch, but then he would come on and off a lot, which was really painful because it was most painful when he initially tried to latch. Um, And he just wouldn't stay on with a good latch long enough for him to get enough milk. My midwives had reached out to a lactation consultant, and she came and said that it looked like he had a posterior tongue tie. So it wasn't super obvious in the beginning, but based on the behavior and the damage that I was getting. Um, she gave me some tips and some resources and they also, she also suggested possibly trying craniosacral therapy, uh, which is done with a chiropractor and they can kind of help relax their mouth and their jaw and their head and make sure that they're aligned well. Um, cause sometimes things can happen in birth or however they were sitting in the womb that can make breastfeeding harder. So we thought we'd try that. We really didn't want to 
go have his tongue clipped unless we needed to. Um, we didn't, you know, we have this tiny little newborn baby and you don't want to put them through a procedure unless you really have to. But unfortunately, um, let's see, by one and a half weeks, I was pumping six to eight times per day. So mostly pumping, but still trying to feed him first. We went to a few, like probably three or four sessions of craniosacral therapy and it helped, um, it helped him relax. It helped his jaw untense, um, but it didn't fix the problem. By the time he was three weeks old, I had another like pretty bad block duct on my left breast again. And I saw another lactation consultant just for a second opinion. And she said that he had a high palate and also likely a posterior tongue tie and not very good tongue movement because of that. And she really recommended that the tongue clipping would probably make a big difference for us. So we decided to go ahead and get that done. She made a recommendation to a pediatric dentist. Um, And then also at that same time, I was going through the pretty, the case of mastitis was starting to get pretty significant and pretty painful. Um, So I was able to get a televisit with a doctor and get a prescription for antibiotics. And she told me if it didn't get better in 36 hours that I needed to go in and see someone else, um, and have a doctor actually take a look at it. So that Thursday we went in and had Oliver's tongue clipped and it was actually, he actually had an upper lip tie too. So we had both of those done cause they could just do it at the same time. And, and it was basically the same recovery. Um, the nice part was he did it with a laser. So it was like the most current technology, um, very fast and, uh, very minimal, like healing, like basically no bleeding, um, with that, which was great. Cause that was like, you know, the best, if you're going to have it done, like the best possible, we wanted to go with the best possible option. Um, but you do have to do these exercises in order to keep the tongue from healing back down the way it was. Um, so every like four hours, you kind of have to torture your baby <laughs> for 10 to 15 yeah, seconds, it's not fun. which is horrible <laughs> because, you know, you're just, you don't want to make them cry and scream, but, um, we wanted it to work. So we, you know, we did it. Um, and you have to keep that up for like four to six weeks. Um, so then unfortunately we went Thursday and then Friday I woke up and the antibiotics had not worked at all and things were getting worse and my breast was super painful. So I called my aunt and she was able to come watch Henry and I went with Oliver, um, to the OB and they took a look at it and they were like, yeah, we're going to send you downstairs. That's an abscess. So they sent me downstairs to surgery and the surgeon, um, cut it open which was really terrible, um, that I would, I would give birth like 10 times over doing that again. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Like it was horrible. Did you just do like a local lidocaine or something? Yeah. Yeah. He just did a local injection and so, which, so I didn't, you know, he numbed it up so I didn't feel it, um, other than like the pressure, but your boob isn't that far away from your face. And I was trying not to watch, but you know, it was just really hard to go through that process. Like right when you have a, you know, three and a half week old baby and or almost four week old baby and you're trying to figure all this other stuff out. And then all of a sudden you have this like medical problem that needs to be dealt with. So, and of course, you know, um, surgeons, I think generally aren't very well versed on breastfeeding and, all of that. So he was like, Oh, you know, this is yeah probably going to be pretty painful for a while. Um, you should, I'll, I'll prescribe you some narcotics. And I was like, uh, no, sorry, I don't want them. Like I'm not taking narcotics while I'm breastfeeding. I'm not taking anything that could go into my milk and, you know, have an effect on my baby. So, and he also told me that I shouldn't pump until the next day. (laughs) And I was like, you don't understand how this works, do you? (laughs) Like, I'm going to get totally Well, you know, I, first of all, I'm trying to also preserve my supply, but you know, I need to, 
pump to relieve engorgement too. Otherwise it's just going to, it's not going to allow things to heal. It's going to make it worse. Right. Um, and more painful. So luckily the OB had given me a couple tips. She said that I could take ibuprofen and acetaminophen. So like every four hours I could take something. And if you rotate those two back and forth, then you're not taking too much of one thing in any given period. So I did that and that was able to like help me manage the pain, uh, which was good. It was like, it took the, you know, it didn't take it away, but it took the edge off enough that I could function and survive. So basically at that point I was bottle feeding and pumping because, you know, with all of my complications and challenges, I just really couldn't focus on breastfeeding at that time. The one lactation consultant had given me some really good advice to put, I put saran wrap over the bandage And that allowed the pump flange to get suction because you can't, you know, you got this bandage. I got a hole like about the size of a penny in my boob and not that far away from the nipple, like right near where the pump flange sits. And then I had this big bandage on top of it. So then if you put saran wrap on top and then the pump flange, you can get the closed suction that you need in order for the pump to work. Oh my gosh, I'm just cringing over here. I can I only imagine how many tears every time you had to pump. Hopefully not TMI for your podcast, but uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it was really challenging. But like I said, I'm so glad I had my midwives who came all the time to help me. And I had the support of that lactation consultant. I was texting her every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. And she was giving me really helpful tips to, you know, help me through that process and and telling me like, it was okay, we could try breastfeeding later. Um, So she really helped me be in the right state of mind, I guess, to get through that process um, and help me with the the mental strength to just keep going. The good thing was that for Oliver, his feeding from the bottle actually got a lot better after his tongue clipping. So it did work for him. You know, he was spitting up a little less. He was able to, like, swallow without a bunch of air. He was faster and more efficient at feeding from the bottle um, after that. So it it really did change the dynamic for him. But he was also just not really that interested in breastfeeding. We tried again. We tried um, as soon as I started healing. It took me about four weeks for the wound to actually close up. And then probably another six weeks for it to like fully just become a little scar. But so we tried in there, you know, when we could, once I was out of pain and I was trying the other breast as well, as much as I could for him to breastfeed. But he just, he decided he really liked the milk, but he did not want to put in the work or (laughs) just wasn't that interested in breastfeeding. He loves snuggling with me, but that just wasn't his thing. So it was hard for me. I had a mourning process for that because I really wanted to breastfeed him. But I had to go through a decision process and decide that despite the fact that he didn't really want to breastfeed and everything we had gone through, um, that I still wanted to give him milk for his first year. So or breast milk for his first year. So I decided to figure out a pumping schedule that would work for me. I ended up going to about four pumps a day up till he was five and a half months old and then went down to uh, three pumps a day till about 11 and a half months. And then I had enough in the freezer that I could start weaning myself off the pump and still give him breast milk to his first year. So, and he just turned one yesterday. So we officially made it. (laughs) Oh, you went through it. Oh my gosh. That was our crazy postpartum story with Oliver. So, and I, there were many times there when I did not think I was going to make it or, you know, I was concerned. I was like, Oh, I don't want to end up in like this pumping hell or it's like, I'm just attached to this machine all day. And, you know, I really, I really had to go through the emotional process and figure out how to make it work. But I also had an incredible support team, you know, two different lactation consultants. And I went to La Leche. I've been going to La Leche meetings every month, um, which has been super helpful. And uh, my midwives have been amazing and very supportive and gone above and beyond. And of course, you know, my husband and my mom and my family have been also incredibly, I had various 
um, family members come in and help out with our toddler and with Oliver, especially during those first few months postpartum when we were having a challenging time. And my village, just my, you know, my best friends, everybody um, just really came around us and supported us and helped us through that time, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's definitely necessary when you're going through all of yeah. that. Yes, it's, uh, I'm very, very grateful for everybody that helped us out with this process. So, well, do you have any resources that you want to share that you didn't get to mention yet? Yeah. So I, I mentioned the La Leche League, the, they, um, were amazing. Um, my woodwives, obviously. So Rachel Fox Tierney, Rachel Keen and Leslie. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say too, about our second birth versus our first is that having that home birth and having her hold the space for me, I had heard that term before, but when I experienced it, it was incredible. You know, she didn't get in the way. She didn't tell me what to do. She didn't, you know, tell me to push like the doctor had with my first birth. She just held that space and it was, it was a holy moment. It was amazing. And I'm so grateful for that. And also there's a channel on Facebook called birth tube, which is pretty amazing. You can watch live births on there. Um, and that's a cool way to really see a wide variety of births. Um, as well as like, you know, the resource like your podcast, listen to birth stories. Uh, that's really helpful. Uh, in just kind of getting accustomed with the spectrum of birth and understanding that you have no control over the process and, just letting things go how they are supposed to go. Um, and then also there's a all about breastfeeding podcast by a lactation consultant. And she had a few episodes specifically on tongue tie, which were really helpful for me to listen to and hear other moms experiences and stories and, you know, their, their challenges. That was really good. Um, and then there's also another podcast called the longest shortest time which is um, more about parenting than necessarily birth and babies, but it's a, it's a great parenting podcast to listen to. Awesome. Well, we'll put those on the show notes page. And then did you want to share where people can find you to connect? So my email is my name, Linnea Headley Borden at gmail.com. And um, feel free to reach out and email me. My Instagram is Linnea.hb. And people can also reach out there. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. Sure. Thank you very much for having me, Bryn. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.